Hey, Laura, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm going to change over and give you um, the power. Okay. Right. Let's see. I'm going to uh, turn turn over host to you. Can there be multiple hosts? I'm just, just curious. Is it? Yes. And you're right. on there as like one of the multiple hosts, but I just really wanted to be sure. All right. That should have come through. Did you get uh, notice? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot of experience with Zoom, but it, it seems pretty, um, pretty obvious how to do it. Like I can mute you like that. I can stop your video. I, mean, I, I think I can figure it out. And do I have to, I mean, do I have to give someone the, the option to share their screen or does that something that's already set up? Oh. You're muted. Sorry. Okay. Um, I think I guess I muted you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, if you go down to the bottom of the screen there below, what I see is Dr. Siegel's name, and yeah. it says share screen, um, I mean, then you can I, just. Yeah, I can, but the, does the presenter, do they have that ability, or do I have to give it to them? You have to give it to them. Okay. Who can share only host all participants it says advanced it says all participants can share hmm. let me take a look here all right screen two my board all right i threw up a whiteboard i don't know if you can see that or not i can see it you can see it okay all right yeah then I think it's safe to give the share screen to everyone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That means that basically anyone that comes in, including the presenter, can come and share their screen. Correct. But okay. I've never had that happen. Your your question is the first I've had about that. So I'll have to do some research there. Yeah, because I ideally you'd probably make I guess it'd be better just to have the person that is presenting mm -hmm. the you know the option to share their screen. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing um, as things can go a little sideways yeah. sometimes in, in a Zoom <laughs> conference call. That is, that is true. Well, if you don't mind, I'll take a quick moment um, and I'll log out. And okay. well, no, actually, I'll stay. I'll just stay hidden in the background just in case you need anything. Okay, um, sounds good. And I'll do a little research about uh, sharing the screen. And if there's a different way, I'll just uh, chat it to you. And people should automatically be muted when they enter, as I understand it. Correct. They should okay. be. Yep. So, okay. All right. If you don't need anything else, I'll uh, pop back in if I can figure that out. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Hello. You're muted. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. Hey, hey, Tika, I just want to say hi. This is Greg hey. Davis. I'm looking forward to hearing you. Good to see you yeah, in something you. other than workout clothes. Yeah, exactly. This is this is how I look when I dress up. <laughs> good to see you. Likewise. I'm wearing my workout clothes. Oh, yeah. you know, I, I was going to comment. <laughs> look very distinguished. Thank you. Dr. Benveniste, you, you should, and I hope I pronounced that right, yes. you should have uh, the option to share your screen. And I think the way that we actually have it set up at the moment is everyone actually has that ability, but you certainly should have that ability. Okay, should I go ahead and just well, do that and make I mean, sure? It doesn't matter, you can now, or yeah, you might as well just try it out, but it's, you know, it's just that green button that says share screen at the bottom. It doesn't always... It looks, it looks good, I mean, it just came up from my, on mine. Okay, is it full screen? Can you see? Yeah, it is. Um, now, every user has the option to actually kind of make it smaller or bigger, but if you hit, I mean, it says I'm viewing your screen, so. Okay, I think, I think, we, let's see. Yeah, and uh, so. Yeah, we're good. Uh, we're good. Yeah, this should be fine. The, um, the one last week, it, it, his screen got, it actually froze from time to time. I'm hope, hoping uh, that doesn't happen this week. Um, 
but I, that's probably something for you know that we can't avoid those maybe from his end I, I haven't noticed too much of an issue with that so okay well we'll keep our fingers crossed yeah and we should have everyone muted hopefully so we shouldn't have any audio disruptions Causes years.
Hello, Tika. Hey, George, how are you? Thank you for... Uh, how was your trip here, coming here? Hopefully things were good. Airports, everything good? My trip? <laughs> you are being facetious. Yes, yeah. it was a very uneventful trip. Thank you. Thank God. You never know these days, you know. You know, I was actually hoping to be able to walk over to West Pavilion, but we couldn't even do that. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's... I'm telling I've, I'm t I mean, I'm the on the president's cabinet. I'm the one who's like pushing for breathing. But there's so I many know. conservatives. I know. I know. Soon, we'll, soon. We'll get there. We'll get yeah. there. It's I seem to have lost host privileges. So I don't know if anyone has that or not, but if there are any audio disruptions, then we'll have to see who can actually mute those people. Hmm. Just FYI. Okay. We'll just holler at them to mute. I tried that last week. <laughs> I do that all the time. All right. <laughs> like Laura is the host. So well, we'll, she gave it to uh, me, but then it lost it again somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should go ahead and start. Hello, everyone. Uh, hopefully, one day this grand round will be accompanied by lunch and uh, we'll be in the uh, room E. We, we don't know what we've uh, been enjoying till we lose it, right? And uh, and we used to think that room, wow, but uh, I, uh, we all miss it. So, but uh, the, the good news today we have, albeit virtually, uh, one of our uh, stars and backbone of this institution, uh, a good uh, colleague and a friend and, uh, and a mentor uh, to me uh, in the last five years that uh, since I joined here. Dr. Tika Benveniste is, uh, needs no introduction, but I hate it when people say that and then they say, okay, here, let, let the person talk. And usually it's because they didn't do their homework and they didn't want to uh, read. I think you don't need an introduction, but you deserve uh, uh, at least a summary of all the amazing stuff you've done for the institution and for your career. And uh, what a model for many of our faculty, uh, especially the women faculty, which we have uh, plenty of, uh, to, uh, to model their career uh, after you. Uh, she's going to be talking to us about her uh, passion, which is uh, autoimmune uh, neuroinflammation uh, and uh, the role of uh, neutrophils uh, in uh, the critical role in neutrophils in developing these diseases. But uh, without dating anyone, uh, Tika went to school in uh, California, so did her uh, under. Uh, grad and uh, at University of California in uh, Los Angeles and did her PhD in UCLA and stayed there and uh, then went did another uh, postdoc uh, uh, at uh, UCLA uh, and at the NIH and a few others before she uh, uh, got a position as a research uh, biologist at the NIH first 
And then uh, came, and you wouldn't know it, this is the news for me reading the CV, that she started at the Department of Neurology as an assistant professor and uh, rose quickly through the ranks, uh, became a uh, founding associate dean of postdoctoral education. Tells you about her passion in, in uh, faculty development and building postdocs and educating them. And then soon after, a chair of the Department of Cell Biology. But that wasn't enough, so she changed the department. She made, uh, she became a founding, founding chair of a department of cell developmental and integrative biology, the CDIB, uh, the famous CDIB. And uh, uh, and after uh, she made sure this is uh, uh, going uh, very well and to to uh, setting it on the right track, uh, she started going uh, higher in the uh, dean suite office, uh, helping as an interim senior associate dean, first for research administration, and more recently as a senior. Uh, uh, associate Dean, uh, Senior Vice Dean for uh, Basic Science, and then Senior Vice Dean uh, for Research. And uh, uh, Tika, uh, looking at her CV, it's, uh, it's amazing. If you want to look at just how many committees and peer review, pages and pages uh, of that. That's what it takes if you want to be a Senior Associate Dean. You have to go through all of these. And I travel to DC every week, but I think Tika looking at her NIH site visits probably had done more mileage to DC than I, than I did. And uh, it's, it's just an impressive publications uh, in the hundreds, uh, awards, well, well-deserved award, including the AAAS uh, fellowship. So it's an honor to have you here. And uh, I'm sure our audience, uh, which is now 79 as we speak, Gonna gonna have uh, uh, a great delight of a talk. Thank you, uh, George. Thank you, really, for a, a most uh, kind uh, introduction. I'm I'm really excited. Uh, you know, I think in all the time I've been here at UAP, I'm not sure I've ever given pathology grand round. So I'd like to thank uh, Adam Wendy for for the invitation to speak, uh, and really looking forward to it. So the title is uh, Critical Contribution of Neutrophils to Autoimmune uh, Neuroinflammation. And this is the disclosure slide, uh, no relevant financial relationships and no conflicts of interest. So I always like to start with acknowledgements uh, and most importantly to acknowledge the people whose data that I will be showing. Um, the project that I'll be talking about was started by Dr. Hungwei uh, Chin in the lab a number of years ago, and then uh, carried forward by two wonderful graduate students, Yu Dong Lu and Chao Chi Yan. Uh, Chao Chi is in the black turtleneck. Um, and, and current lab members um, that are involved in this project, uh, primarily uh, Bill Turbitt, postdoctoral fellow in the lab, and I'll be showing you a, a lot of his data, uh, helped by Jessica Buckley, Leanna Zhao, and I'll show you a, a really nice piece of data from uh, an undergrad in the lab, uh, Rhythm Williams, and a number of really uh, wonderful collaborators. So what I'll do first is introduce the disease, the human disease of multiple sclerosis, and then tell you a little bit about one of the animal models, which is experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. Then uh, talk a little bit about the pathway that we uh, study, the JAKSTAT SOX signaling pathway, and then showing you the data that implicate neutrophils in a particular type of uh, EAE and then talk about what our next steps are. So uh, multiple sclerosis is uh, a true autoimmune disease, a demyelinating disease of the central nervous system that results in uh, motor sensory as well as cognitive dysfunction. There's approximately 1 million people in the United States with MS and like other autoimmune diseases, predominantly in females. Now, the good thing, uh, if you're an MS patient, there's actually over 20 FDA-approved uh, disease-modifying therapies, uh, most which interfere with aspects of the immune response. However, none stop disease progression. The pathological features of MS include infiltration of immune cells into the central nervous system, 
demyelination, gliosis, which is the hyperproliferation of astrocytes, lesion formation, and neurodegeneration. I should also uh, state that, that we still actually do not know what causes MS, but it's clearly uh, a dysfunction of the immune system to, stop, to start. Shown on this slide are a number of the symptoms of MS. MS, like many other diseases, is quite heterogeneous and can present in a number of fashions. So just to walk you through what, what we know about MS is that there is a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and then an infiltration of inflammatory immune cells from the periphery. And you can see that many, both uh, innate and adaptive immune cells infiltrate. And we're gonna focus the talk today primarily on neutrophils and a little bit on macrophages. In addition, MS patients have an imbalance of T effector or pathogenic cells, Th1 and Th17 cells, to T regulatory cells, which tend to provide uh, immunosuppressive function. And these T regs also have decreased suppressor function. There are alterations in endogenous glial cells. I mentioned astrogliosis. Oligodendrocytes, the cells that produce myelin, are damaged or uh, undergo cell death. And microglia, the uh, endogenous brain macrophage, becomes activated um, and is thought initially to promote a lot of the dysregulation of the immune response. And what's been appreciated for about the last 10 years is that there actually is significant neuronal damage with axonal loss and uh, neuron death. Characteristic of MS is the aberrant expression of many pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And what we now appreciate due to a single cell RNA-seq is that there is tremendous heterogeneity of both the infiltrating immune cells and resident glial cells in the disease CNS, as well as regional specialization. So just shown uh, in a pictorial fashion, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, infiltration of myeloid cells, activated T cells, uh, monocytes and neutrophils, and then an amplification of pathogenic Th1 and Th17 subsets, microglial activation, destruction of the myelin sheath and the oligogenic dendrocytes ultimately resulting in neurological impairment. So uh, EAE is one model for multiple sclerosis, and I'm going to talk about active EAE. This is uh, induced by immunization of mice with a variety of neuroantigens. In our case, we use uh, MOG, which is myelin oligodendrocyte uh, glycoprotein. So mice are injected along with pertussis toxin, then get another shot of, of pertussis toxin. And at least in C57 black 6 mice, what they get is what we call classical EAE. This is ascending paralysis with preferential immune cell infiltration into the spinal cord. And this is the model that we'll be using. So the JAK-STAT signaling pathway is used by over 70 uh, different cytokines, uh, interleukins, interferons, and growth factors for signal transduction. And it's really critical for the initiation, regulation, and ultimately termination of um, immune responses of both the innate and adaptive immune system. So a cytokine will bind to its receptor and associated with the cytoplasmic domains are Janus kinases. These are tyrosine kinases. When uh, ligand binds to its receptor, the jacks become activated. They tyrosine phosphorylate each other as well as phosphorylate tyrosine residues in the cytoplasmic domain of the receptor. And then STAT proteins, these stand for signal transducers and activators of transcription are recruited to the receptor complex. They in turn become tyrosine phosphorylated by the JAKs. They form homo and heterodimers, translocate into the nucleus and induce gene expression. Now, one of the genes uh, of the many that are turned on by STATs are genes or proteins known as suppressors of cytokine signaling or SOCs. Uh, these are proteins that actually function as negative regulators of the JAK-STAT pathway. There are eight family members, 
Um, we'll be talking about SOX3 today, but, but there are others. Um, and so they inhibit uh, activation of the JAK-STAT pathway by binding to activated JAKs to inhibit their tyrosine kinase activity. They can compete with STATs, STATs for receptor binding sites. And they also target bound proteins, particularly the JAK kinases for degradation. Dysregulation of this JAK-STAT SOX pathway has pathological implications, particularly for autoimmune and inflammatory diseases, as well as a number of cancers. And this is a case for patients with MS where there is usually overactivation of the JAK-STAT pathway. So there's, a lot, there's been a lot of literature of how the JAK-STAT pathway in T cells contributes to MS and EAE, but much less known about what was happening in myeloid cells. So we asked a question, does hyperactivated STAT signaling in myeloid cells contribute to autoimmune neuroinflammation? And to do this, we generated mice that were um, uh, deleted of SOX3 in myeloid cells. So the first thing I should tell you, uh, we chose SOX3. This is a protein that we've been studying for quite a few years in terms of how it regulated uh, functionality in um, myeloid cells as well as astrocytes. So we, we knew a lot about how it worked. What is known is that genetic deletion of SOX3 is embryonic lethal. So we generated mice deficient in SOX3, particularly in cells of the myeloid lineage by crossing with lysome pre-mice. This leads to complete deletion in bone marrow derived macrophages and neutrophils. And we initially started this study focusing more on myeloid cells and macrophages. So what we noticed is in the absence of SOX3, there is elevated STAT3 activation as assessed by tyrosine phosphorylation. And then character characterization of SOX3 deficient macrophages uh, demonstrated that these cells are in fact uh, more polarized to a pro-inflammatory phenotype. They express high levels of a variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. They can induce the differentiation and polarization of CD4, TH1, and TH17 cells, and can also promote neuronal death. So having these mice in hand and having uh, characterized these cells, we then subjected them to active EAE. And uh, what's shown in panel B is the control mice, SOX3 flux uh, with uh, MOG immunization, uh, exhibit the classical EAE pattern that I showed you previously. However, the mice deficient in SOX3 in myeloid cells did not. Rather, as shown in panel A, they exhibited a different type of EAE that's called atypical or brain targeted. Um, these mice exhibit uh, not the hind limb paralysis, rather uh, ataxia and tremors, and the cerebellum is involved more so than uh, spinal cord. So the differences between these, these two phenotypes, if you will, is the classical EAE invo involves a hind limb and forelimb paralysis, predominantly with cells infiltrating the spinal cord. In brain-targeted EAE, they have ataxia and tremors and involvement predominantly of the cerebellum. So two very different types of EAE. So in a number of studies, we, we did further characterization of this model and we saw extensive inflammation in the cerebellum accompanied by demyelination and axonal damage, heightened activation of stats in the cerebellum, predominantly stat one, three, and four. Looking at the infiltrating macrophages as well as resident microglia, we found that they were polarized more to a pro-inflammatory phenotype. We also saw that Th1 and Th17 cells, B cells, dendritic cells, and neutrophils also infiltrated the cerebellum. Neutrophils were the first cell to infiltrate and also the most numerous. And for a variety of reasons based on data, uh, we really started to focus more on the neutrophils and ask about their involvement in brain-targeted EAE. 
And this is an older study done by uh, Yu Dong Lu, where he uh, simply used a antibody to deplete neutrophils. And what you can appreciate is that the EAE score of the atypical or brain targeted EAE is significantly diminished. So this at least started giving us a clue that neutrophils were involved in this particular phenotype. So for, for those of you that don't live and breathe neutrophils, just a little bit about them. They're the most abundant leukocyte in the blood and the first to be deployed to sites of inf inflammation. And I think it's fair to say that, that historically, they really um, weren't paid that much attention. They were thought to be short-term effectors with no long-lasting impact on immunological responses. And we, we know now that that actually is not the case, that they are very important cells of the innate immune response. They're phagocytic. They produce uh, very high levels of reactive oxygen species. They produce neutrophil extracellular traps or nets, produce many different cytokines and chemokines, and can actually function as antigen presenting cells. And neutrophils can either activate or suppress uh, other components of the immune system, depending on disease context and the microenvironment. And what we appreciate now is that there, there actually is significant phenotypic diversity of neutrophils due to transcriptional plasticity. And especially in a variety of cancer models, single cell RNA-seq has revealed significant neutrophil heterogeneity. And this is just a depiction of the many different functions of neutrophils having impacts on other innate immune cells, as well as cells of the adaptive immune system. So this led us to ask, what's the mechanism by which neutrophils induce this brain-targeted EAE? And so first, just some characterization of, of the mice. You can see in panel A, the demyelination in the cerebellum. Uh, there is an increase in the overall number of neutrophils within the cerebellum. And the phenotype of these uh, neutrophils, they have uh, enhanced levels of CD11B, reduced levels of CD62L and CXCR2, as well as an increase in ROS production. And this phenotype is actually characteristic of what are called prime or aged neutrophils. Uh, these are characterized by high expression of CXCR4, low expression of CD62L, and globally, they're thought to represent an overly activated subset of neutrophils that have pro-inflammatory functions and enhanced uh, production of reactive oxygen species. And in fact, circulating neutrophils from MS patients are characterized by this phenotype. So the first question then, is this ROS production by neutrophils relevant uh, to brain-targeted EAE and to to, ask, uh, to answer this, we did an in vivo experiment uh, treating mice with a Ross scavenger cocktail as shown here. And what you can see is that the uh, clinical score of brain targeted EAE is significantly reduced. Uh, demyelination is actually uh, pre uh, prevented. And so this implicates ROS. And so the next question is, what might actually be activating these neutrophils, both in vitro and in vivo? So here we switch back to just looking at neutrophils from C57 black 6 mice, so just wild type neutrophils, and stimulated them with a variety of cytokines that activate the JAK-STAT pathway. And here we're actually looking at SOX3 expression as a readout. And what you can see here is that of all the cytokines that we tested, GCSF, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, was by far the most potent activator of neutrophils. And when we then tested neutrophils from our SOX3 flox or our Lysum uh, Cree mice, we can see that uh, they are both responsive to GCSF. And here we're looking at phosphorylation of STAT3. But you can appreciate that uh, neutrophils lacking SOX3 have an even more pronounced response. So this is nice. This is in vitro data. What is actually happening in vivo? So in this case, we use neutralizing antibodies against uh, GCSF 
And again, you can appreciate an almost complete suppression of the clinical scores, again, while we prevent demyelination. So from this part of the data, what I've shown you is that neutrophils that are lacking SOX3, uh, and these are coming from the cerebellum of mice with brain-targeted EAE, produce very high levels of a range of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. They produce uh, ROS. They also make a number of components of the complement cascade. They have a heightened responsiveness to GCSF and display prolonged activation of the STAT3 pathway. And so they express markers reflective of a primed or aged neutrophil. And so three types of experiments done in vivo, depletion of neutrophils uh, suppresses disease onset and severity. Treatment with ROS scavengers reduces disease severity of brain-targeted EAE. And in data, I did didn't show you um, in part by reducing the infiltration of both neutrophils and macrophages into the cerebellum. And similarly, treating with neutralizing GCSF antibodies, we saw the same effect, uh, ameliorating brain-targeted EAE, uh, in part again by suppressing neutrophil and macrophage infiltration into the cerebellum. And so the characteristics of these SOX3 deficient neutrophils uh, reflect the phenotype of circulating neutrophils from MS patients, elevated degranulation, resistant to apoptosis, enhanced production of ROS and NETS. So these studies certainly uh, implicated neutrophils as having a very important role in brain-targeted EAE but there were limitations. And the first is that this mouse that we generated lacks SOX3, not only in neutrophils, but also in monocytes and macrophages. So that's problem number one. And problem number two is that the Ross scavenger treatment, as well as treatment with neutralizing GCSF antibodies, uh, certainly affected the neutrophils, but also affected macrophage infiltration into the cerebellum. So we really needed a system in which we could study the role of neutrophils specifically. And that was really to try to address the question, are hyperactivated neutrophils in and of themselves sufficient to induce brain-targeted EAE? And to do this, we generated mice with SOX3 deletion exclusively in neutrophils using what are called catch-up mice. Um, these have a Lys6G neutrophil-specific loci uh, modified to drive expression of both CRE and um, TD tomato. So these were crossed with our SOX3 flox mice. And what I should mention, uh, the mice that we got from Matthias uh, Gunzer, the neutrophils from these mice are functionally normal and present in physiological numbers. So uh, we generated these mice and then COVID hit, sadly, and so they, they sort of languished for a while. Uh, but then uh, we were able to get back in the lab and um, perform experiments on them. And I, again, I should mention that uh, these mice do have a complete SOX3 deletion in bone marrow-derived neutrophils. So these are studies that Bill Turbot did uh, when he uh, joined the lab. And obviously, the thing we were anxious about is, were these mice these with SOX3 specific deletion only in the neutrophils, would they get brain targeted EAE? And shown in the middle panel, you can see in fact that these mice really phenocopy uh, the mice that lack SOX3 in both neutrophils and macrophages. So that was reassuring uh, to put it mildly. And survival analysis shows an almost identical uh, pattern of uh, cell uh, of, of death of mice in uh, both of these uh, transgenic mice. So we were very reassured uh, by these data that in fact it was valid to use these mice to continue our studies. So again, looking at the cerebellum, we can see a pronounced demyelination in the cerebellum of the Lys6G mice compared to controls. And Bill has carried out a series of characterization 
looking at isolated neutrophils from the cerebellum compared to controls. What we again appreciate are increased numbers of neutrophils within the cerebellum. We looked again, sort of that phenotypic assessment. Uh, we see there's an increase in CD11B, a decrease in CD62L, and an increase in mean fluorescence of reactive oxygen species compared to the controls. And the next thing that Bill did was to look at the uh, milieu, if you will, within the cerebellum, looking at a variety of cytokines and chemokines, again, comparing um, our control mice to the mice lacking SOX3. And what he found is that there was an increase uh, in almost all cases of um, cytokines and chemokines that are related to neutrophil functionality, including GCSF itself, interleukin-1 alpha and beta, IL-6, CXCL-2, as well as increases in gamma interferon, TNF alpha, GMCSF, and CCL-2. Now, these mice, uh, similar to the, the lice uh, m -Cree mice, also had an increase in the number of infiltrating CD4 positive T cells into the cerebellum. And what Bill did was to characterize uh, whether they were the Th1 cells producing gamma interferon, Th17 cells producing um, IL-17A, uh, double negatives or double positives. And what was interesting is the majority of the CD4 positive T cells infiltrating the cerebellum were actually Th1 cells producing gamma interferon. This is, this is actually quite different in the lice, uh, in the lice M Cree mice, uh, we saw a pre, uh, predominant infiltration of IL-17 producing Th17 cells. So that's one not notable difference that we've observed between these uh, two different um, transgenic mice strains. The Th7, excuse me, the Th1 cells that infiltrate are also producing higher levels of GMCSF. And this is uh, the data that Rhythm uh, Williams did over the summer showing some of that. Um, she isolated uh, neutrophils from the bone marrow. So these are bone marrow derived neutrophils from uh, the lice 6G controls uh, and the SOX3 deficient mice. These cells were stimulated with uh, GCSF for a variety of time periods. And I think what you can appreciate in panels A and B is that there is heightened activation of both STAT3 and STAT5 in neutrophils lacking SOX3, uh, which is uh, sustained over time. In addition, uh, the neutrophils lacking SOX3 produce significantly higher levels of CXCL2, HIF1 alpha, as well as IL-1 beta. So I mentioned um, neutrophil extracellular traps or NETs. Um, this is a, a really complicated process and this is a, a, a very uh, simplistic schematic. Um, but what happens is uh, neutrophils will secrete web, a web-like structure of extracellular DNA and chromatin that's decorated with histones. This secretion can lead to the death of neutrophils, but it also can occur in the absence of cell death. So nets uh, probably are really best known for their important role in host defense against viruses and bacteria. So this is a very beneficial effect of nets. However, they've also been implicated in a number of autoimmune diseases, including uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Now, what do we know about nets in the context of MS? Well, not much other than, again, circulating neutrophils from MS patients are characterized by enhanced net formation, but we still don't know what that really means in terms of functionality. And, uh, any possible role in EAE disease is unknown. So uh, Bill has looked uh, for, for this net formation, this process of netosis. Uh, citronated histone-3 serves as a marker of nets. 
So here um, he's looking at the cerebellum of mice at the peak of EAE disease, first staining for lice 6G, which identifies the infiltrating neutrophils, and then uh, looking for uh, the net marker. And I think you can appreciate, we do see again, this very significant infiltration of neutrophils in the cerebellum in mice lacking SOX3. We do see uh, evidence for net formation with, uh, with some co-localization with neutrophils. This is a very preliminary study and Bill is expanding this actually uh, by doing RNA scope as well as further analysis. But at least this piece of data does suggest that we do see net formation in the cerebellum of mice with brain-targeted EAE. And what we need to do next is also determine if, if this is uh, relevant in terms of disease pathogenesis. So in summary, I've shown you that SOX3 deletion that's specific to neutrophils is in fact sufficient to induce the brain-targeted EAE phenotype. These mice display an increased uh, cerebellum neutrophil infiltration, and these neutrophils have a primed phenotype. Cerebellar CD4 positive T cells from these mice skew towards a Th1 phenotype with increased expression of GMCSF. And we do have evidence for net formation in mice with brain-targeted EAE. So we believe that these studies do implicate hyperactivated neutrophils as instigators of brain-targeted EAE. And as I mentioned, further characterization of these mice is ongoing. So for the last few minutes, what I'd like to do is actually take you back to some studies that we did using the lice M uh, Cree mice. So remember, these are the mice that have SOX3 deletion in both um, macrophages as well as neutrophils. And we've performed single cell RNA seq of these myeloid cells in mice with either classical or brain targeted EAE. So single cell RNA seq was performed on sorted CD45 positive, CD11B positive myeloid cells. And what we looked at uh, were the myeloid cells from the spinal cord of our control mice, uh, SOX3 floxed, at the peak of classical EAE. So remember, this is predominantly uh, disease in the spinal cord. And then we looked at myeloid cells from the cerebellum of our SOX3 lice M mice at the peak of brain-targeted EAE. So by unsupervised clustering, uh, we were able to identify five neutrophil clusters. We call them KNU1, 2, 3, and 4, and PRENU. Uh, two macrophage clusters, one microglial cluster, and one dendritic cell cluster. And you can see sort of um, by, by UMAP what this visually looks like. Now, if we compare the, um, the spinal cord uh, infiltration or the, the frequency of these cells in the spinal cord versus the cerebellum in panel C, you can see in the spinal cord that there is uh, there are more um, myeloids or cells of the myeloid lineage, I should say, uh, infiltrating compared to neutrophils, while in the cerebellum of our SOX3 deficient mice, there are uh, more neutrophils than there are myeloid cells. And so we've done some characterization of, of the genes that identify these five different clusters. And many of them are actually um, have functional implications for neutrophil functionality. So we are actively working on that right now. So, you know, this, this is nice, but it doesn't tell you anything about the possible function of these different neutrophil clusters. Um, so they have different transcriptional profiles, but do they have different functions? And so this, this is more challenging. For those of you that work with neutrophils, these, these are not the happiest cells to work with. Um, but what Bill has done is he's devised a, a flow, flow panel to try to isolate out these different neutrophil clusters. 
And so starting off with total neutrophils as shown in A, uh, based on some of the trans uh, transcriptional data, he's developed a, a scheme to isolate, or I shouldn't say isolate, enrich for the different, um, the five different neutrophil clusters. And so what's shown in panel B is the result of that sort. And what you can see is that he actually was able to enrich for the K nu one cluster in blue and the K nu three cluster in orange as shown there. And of course, one of the most important and sort of uh, vexing issues with working with neutrophils is they are short lived. And so this issue of viability becomes very important, especially when you've subjected them to this flow sort. And fortunately, Bill was able to show that in fact, these cells, uh, these enriched clusters, if you will, were in fact viable. And so this, uh, this gives us hope that we will actually be able to functionally characterize these cells in a variety of assays. And those are studies that are currently ongoing. But now that we have uh, the mice that are deficient in SOX3 specifically in neutrophils, we feel that this is a cleaner system to study. So in experiments that, that hopefully will occur very soon, we will be doing single cell RNA-seq on um, mice, both the controls that get classical EAE and our Ly6G mice with brain targeted EAE looking at them under uh, naive conditions, then induce EAE and look at them at the preclinical stage as well as peak of disease, looking at both the cerebellum and the spinal cord. We will again sort for myeloid cells because we will be interested uh, in, this, in this setting to see not only what is happening with the neutrophils, but what's happening with the infiltrating uh, macrophages and resident microglia. And just as a preliminary experiment using the flow sort that he devised originally, uh, looking at neutrophils uh, from the mice with um, uh, deficient in SOX3 specifically in neutrophils, Bill is also able to enrich for the new one and new three clusters. So two slides just to finish off. We, we do believe that uh, neutrophils are important uh, innate immune cells in the context of EAE. And there are many different uh, sort of uh, locations, if you will, where they can be functioning. In the periphery, uh, they may be functioning uh, to prime or activate dendritic cells, uh, leading to dendritic cell uh, activation uh, antigen presentation then to T cells to drive both T cell and B cell differentiation. We know in the EAE context, these neutrophils are able to traffic um, and cross the blood brain barrier as shown sort of in D, this recruitment where they bind and then can extravasate uh, into the CNS parenchyma in the brain targeted EAE specifically within the cerebellum. We know that neutrophils do contribute to the blood-brain barrier disruption there, that is characteristic of EAE. And we think then once within the cerebellum that they can continue uh, to activate dendritic cells or other antigen presenting cells leading to contributed, uh, continued activation of T cells, both Th1 and Th17 cells. There is also literature that activated neutrophils can, in fact, uh, cause death of oligodendrocytes. So it's possible there that they can contribute to um, uh, demyelination. They are also uh, functioning in terms of phagocytosis, uh, leading uh, to further myelin damage. And these are all aspects that we will be looking at uh, in the context of our brain-targeted EAE model. And lastly, I should mention that neutrophils um, are implicated not only in multiple sclerosis, but other neuroinflammatory and neurodegenerative diseases, uh, including neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. Actually, quite a bit of literature from Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, 
an ischemic brain injury. But it's important to recognize that they actually have different functions depending on the model. So in preclinical models of MS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and stroke, neutrophils are considered to be pathogenic by induction of neuronal damage and detrimental CNS, immune and inflammatory responses. However, Ben Siegel's group from Ohio State has identified protective and actually beneficial neutrophils that um, can inhibit neuronal damage and actually promote axonal regeneration. And these, these different functionalities certainly are reflective of neutrophil heterogeneity. So our ultimate goal is to elucidate neutrophil plasticity, heterogeneity, and functionality as related to neuroinflammation. And that is my last slide. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. So uh, we can do questions through uh, either raise your hand or uh, through the chat. Uh, we can start with uh, Xu Feng has, has a question. Does the difference in TH cell infiltration observed in SOX3 slash lies M Cree versus SOX3 lies G Cree suggest that macrophages are responsible for TH17 infiltration? In the yeah, that. You know, that, that that's a very good point. Um, I think it I think it certainly implicates the macrophage as being involved in that TH17 predominant polarization that we see in the lice M cre mice compared to the lice 6 G mice. Um, and that's why we felt it was really important that we had to have a cleaner system to really study the, the neutrophils themselves. Excellent. Uh, Raj uh, Surapan, I think. Dr. Benavisti, very interesting information uh, on neutrophils and their roles in autoimmune diseases, particularly suppressing ROS, ROS signaling, very interesting. What are the components present in the uh, ROS scavenger cocktail? So I knew somebody would ask that. It, it was on the slide and I can't remember. Um, but it was on that slide. Oh, Rakesh, do you know? You must know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw the list, but I have a question about that list also. So. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, so I will get back to you. I will send you that list. Uh, what, do, what, Rakesh, what's the question about that list? Well, so I have two questions uh, related. One was that one, one of the um, compounds you had on that list was a peroxynitrite scavenger, which implies a role for nitric oxide as well. And so the question is, has anybody looked at whether or not the NNOS or INOS derived NO is playing a role in, in this model? Oh, that, that's a great question. We actually haven't looked at it in these neutrophil specific knockouts. We did a little bit in, in the other model. Uh, we did see elevated INOS, but I don't think we characterized it we, we, we did look at NO production, I should say that. Um, and again, it was, it was heightened in the absence of SOX3, but we didn't delve into that pathway uh, in too much detail. Uh, well, so related to that, there are some really good NOS inhibitors now that uh, work very well in the animals. So if, just as a suggestion. Uh, but my other question is, it's a bit more neutrophil centric in that, um, have you or has anybody else looked at the role of uh, chlorinated species, so specifically, you know, hypochlorous acid that are derived, produced by activated neutrophils. So it's all, it's a signature for neutrophils, and there are a suite of different chlorinated species that are formed, some of which activate NETs, uh, chlorinated fatty acids and lipids, for example. And, and the reason why it's fascinating in the brain, which has its relatively unique composition of lipids that are, that are susceptible to reactive chlorine damage. So we have not, but that would be really, you know, we really want to know what these neutrophils are doing. And so this is, this is a great suggestion, um, not one that we had have looked at or thought about. And so would love to come talk with you about that and get your thoughts. Yeah. Thank okay. You. I'll follow up. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So from, uh, 
Awal Chada, we have three questions. Great talks. I have a few questions. What is the main chemokine responsible for neutrophil recruitment? Second question, do you think that the difference between the percentage of neutrophils in classic versus atypical EAE is uh, represent differences in chemokines responsible for their recruits? And the third question is, with high CDs 270, uh, 274, how do you explain increased TH17 activity given the predominant T-cell suppressive action of CD274? Yeah, thank you. Oh, uh... First question was difference yeah. in percentage between um, typical and native. So, no, no so what, what is the main chemokine? Um, we don't know. You, I think you could see from the data that I showed as well as, as other data, we have quite a few chemokines that are being expressed and we have not, um, I, we have not been able to really parse out which one in particular is specifically responsible for neutrophil recruitment. Um, we've thought about doing, you know, neutralizing antibody studies, um, and we, we probably need to do that or cross them perhaps to, to some of the chemokine knockouts, but we don't know if there is really one that is specifically responsible for neutrophil recruitment. Um, yeah, and so I think then that that feeds into question number two, if the difference in the percentage of neutrophils uh, is, reflects that difference in chemokine expression. So I think, I think once we know the answer to one, we'll know the answer to two. And then, um, yeah, so, so the CD274 is perplexing. Um, and actually, the data on the TH ones was a surprise to us. So we don't we don't have that much more data other than what I showed you. And I think we really we need to look at that uh, much more in depth. Um, what what would be your thoughts on that, or do you just think it's totally strange? So I've been looking at neutrophils in the context of colon cancer. And these are MDSCs predominantly is what I think because of high arginase expression. Uh, and they have high PDL1. So in, in the model that we use, I think that they are suppressive. And so, and the reason I say that is because of the, uh, the sort of the arginase and other stuff that they make, but also the fact that the T cells that are there in the tumor compared to the surrounding colon have a higher expression of PD1. And so, I mean, my thought process through that has been that, you know, the PDL one is kind of acting as a suppressive molecule. Right, right. So I'm not sure if in this model system, it changes anything, you know? Yeah, no, it, it, it's, a, it's a good point. And I think one that we really, we need to further explore. Thank you. And then Robin has, I knew Robin would ask this. Um, while I know it would be technically challenging, would it be possible to determine genome-wide changes in STAT-3 recruitment in the SOX-3 deficient neutrophils? So that would be really interesting to look at. Um, it would be technically challenging, but uh, we would love to do that. And perhaps we can come talk with you about what would be the bare minimum number of cells, viable cells we would need to do that. Because that that is the limitation with with neutrophils, especially then getting them from the brain. Um, we could potentially look at doing that. Robin, you get to you need to be closer. You're yeah, I can't up. hear. Oh, sorry, I don't have my microphone on. Uh, I potentially we could try cut and run. Okay. Um, let's. See. Oh, so Aaron. Oh, let's see. Ah, somebody, somebody else, everyone's interested in neutrophil recruitment chemokines. Um, what is the source? Well, so the, the, the neutrophils themselves, the macrophages, I think every immune cell that's in the brain is making these different chemokines, as do um, endothelial cells, astrocytes, and microglia. So I would, just given this massively inflamed CNS microenvironment, I would suspect that these chemokines and the cytokines that we talked about are coming from a variety of cell types. 
So Aaron is asking, um, it's interesting to see SOX3 deficient neutrophils show high levels of net formation. Is it known whether it causes activation of the gas sting pathway? Um, Aaron, we have not looked at that, but that's a, that, that's a, a really intriguing possibility. So thank you. Uh, Cause I think it can code NF kappa B and TBK other inflammatory signaling. So I would. Ab wonder. Absolutely, absolutely. Ah, so we have a gender, a gender uh, question. In our mouse model, is there any severity difference between male and female? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, to my recollection, the answer is no. But having said that, just in EAE in general, um, and this is kind of contradictory to the, to the. Um, human disease in EAE, male mice get more severe EAE than do female mice, but then that's different than what we see with MS patients. But at least with our model, we've not detected any differences between male and female. All right, if uh, there's no more questions, well, one more. Greg Davis. Thank you, Tika. You make bench oh. science comprehensible to us <laughs> clinical physicians. A precious skill. Craig is my he's my Pilates. Greg's my Pilates partner in, in pre-COVID oh. days. So uh, um, that, that, I'm glad that, we got to like see each other in a different context today. That's wonderful. But, but, oh, and I, Robin too. Robin goes to Pilates. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. <laughs> It's been uh, very enjoyable and uh, so well attended. And uh, yeah, don't take five more years to come back and give a grand round. You may get I a won't. lot of great ideas from pathologists. I won't, I won't. Ah, please. Forrest, I'm gonna follow up with you on this question, okay? All right, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, thank you everyone, bye-bye. And speaking of Greg Davis, he is doing the talk next week. And so I hope we have a hundred people there like we had this week. Wow, wonderful, thank you. All right, <laughs> let's shoot for that. Thank It'll you. be on COVID and the opioid epidemic. Oh. All righty, the double whammy. All right. Thanks.